Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Sonika Garcia. And I'm Brad Davidson, and this is Breaking the Code. A podcast series focused on debunking the myths about the discipline of behavioral science and arming our listeners with the information they need to make sense of behavioral science and how to help them apply it to their work as marketers. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. This is episode five, and we've titled this episode, Why Not Fear? What we really want to discuss in today's episode, or at least I should say start the discussion on because there's a lot to unpack, is the topic of emotions. Previously in other episodes, we've talked about how emotions are a really strong driver of behavior. Emotions account for about 90% of the decisions that we make on a daily basis. And with that being said, in our role as marketers, understanding emotions is even more important because we need to really be able to accurately understand the emotional state of of our consumers at every moment in time, how we need to understand how that emotional state really came to be and all the contextual factors surrounding it. And then once we have that complete picture, we need to be able to decipher the best way to really apply that learning to our communication efforts. So our thinking for this episode was really born out of a recent ask from one of our team members, which was, is fear actually a long-term motivator for health behavior? This ask was specifically in the vaccine space, but really it applies to you know, any disease state. For those of you listening in who work at Havas, this might sound familiar because we recently did a POV on this topic, but for our listeners who are are not familiar with this topic, Brad, can you tell us, is fear actually a long-term motivator or driver of health decisions? Thanks, Nika. That's a good question. So with one big asterisk, fear is not a great motivator to use. The big asterisk in healthcare is fear of death. We do know that people who have really assimilated and internalized a fear, a lot of times it's something like uh, my dad died of a heart attack at 50 and I'm, I'm very scared of that. Those kinds of people will definitely take on board uh, life changes, but they, they start very young and it's something that's been impressed upon them. So you'll you'll meet a lot of vegans or I'm not so sure about vegans, but you'll meet a lot of people who are very health conscious, driven by this fear of death. That one works. However, external fear, things that I tell you you should be scared of, that doesn't work very well. And I'll give you the reasoning why. So the first thing is uh, fear is transient. It, it has a physical response to it. It provokes our fight or flight response, those of us who learned that in high school or junior high school. And, and what it does is it starts releasing stress hormones. It starts raising your blood pressure. Your pulse rate goes up your skin temperature goes up, all those sorts of things that get you ready to like engage in a massive fight of some sort or a big run away from a tiger. Those things are actually damaging to you physically as well as emotionally and mentally. And so our body has mechanisms for shutting that down as quickly as it can. And then also our brain has mechanisms for packaging it up and putting it in a corner so that we, uh, we, don't, we don't live in a state of constant fear. The example of this that people use a lot is everybody has religion as you leave church, as they used to say, meaning when you leave the hospital after having suffered a, a massive heart attack, for example, everybody's pretty good about taking their medications for a short while. But 50% of patients drop off of their medication starting at three months post-discharge and it gets to about a full 50% at six months. So that kind of fear doesn't really translate into sustainable action. That's why the long-term part doesn't work. The short-term part doesn't work because fear is uncontrollable and it's very unpredictable. So what we do when we're afraid isn't necessarily go straight at the fear. We don't fully feel in control of our actions when we're afraid. So that's a big deal. We think that like, oh, somebody's afraid. They're going to do what we think we want them to do. If they're afraid of COVID, they'll go get a vaccine. That's not what happens. It's very unpredictable what people will do with fear. Really, the only time fear works in terms of an advertising or communications stance is if it's something that you can act on immediately, right? So if, if I threaten you physically and say, give me your money, you'll give me your money. 
But if you can get away and get around the corner, the first thing you start thinking is, I'm going to call the cops, not like, oh, I was afraid to block away, so I should get my money out of the ATM, right? Like it's, if you can make a decision based on fear immediately, um, that's the essence of a hard sell. Uh, Sonika, if you don't put the undercoat on your car, it's going to rust out. I don't want the undercoat. That person will really try and scare you at that moment, that car salesman, because he knows or she knows that if you walk out of that car dealership without the undercoat purchased, you're never going to purchase it because the minute you drive away, you're not afraid of it anymore. And so um, it doesn't really work the way we think it does. It certainly isn't a reliable motivator for healthcare. When when it works is when you're just pushing people to say yes at that moment. So I don't think it's a good lever for a variety of reasons, but I think the one that I really sort of always come back to is it's also damaging. Um, it's not really in our best interests to scare people because we've just caused them harm. So for a variety of reasons, I, I just don't think it's a great motivator, but they're very, very complicated. And we're going to get into that. So Sonika, you know, again, emotions are very complicated. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Brad. So I think in the work that we do within healthcare marketing, we really need to rethink the way that we dig in and apply emotions. Um, I think currently we tend to oversimplify it a bit. And and by doing that, we we really might as well not even be considering emotion at all, because when we when we oversimplify emotion, we're, we're really doing ourselves a disservice in marketing because that personalization and that that granularity that's needed to really understand the human will be missing. So let's let's take a step back and think about the work that we do and, and where emotion really p plays a part. Emotion obviously plays a part in various different projects, work streams, but journey work, right? We all, you know, do uh, doctor and patient journeys. And oftentimes journey work and the research that goes into it is the foundation for everything else that we do on a brand. So it's a really important work stream. And part of a journey is the feeling part, which is the emotional part. So if we are trying to, at that moment, hypothesize an emotional driver based on some research that we have, whether it be primary or secondary research, we really need to make sure that we're doing it the best way possible. So the first thing that I want to call out is that emotions don't come from a place that people oftentimes understand, or I should say really understand. So it requires some work to really accurately be able to uncover the emotions that we're talking about. It's not as simple as just in an interview asking a doctor, hey, how do you feel about XYZ? Or how do you feel at the moment of diagnosis? It's really on us to be able to one, ask the question in a way that's going to uncover the actual emotional state, and then two, be able to analyze a certain research output to pull out an emotion. So what I think we need to rethink, and we oftentimes, back to the oversimplification, is we oftentimes talk about emotions as in the primary emotional state. So there's about 10 or so primary emotions, things like fear, joy, sadness, and that's really, really where we stop. So we'll say, okay, at the, at, you know, the moment of diagnosis, a patient is feeling fear. All patients in this disease state are feeling fearful. Well, sure, that might be the case, but it's more than just the primary emotion. The source of that primary emotion, so the source of fear, is different between two people who are dealing with the same condition, between two doctors who are prescribing or working in the same you know, disease state. So it's important for us to understand fear in, in the secondary emotional state. And secondary emotions, there are about a hundred of them. So there's, it's, it gets a lot more in depth than just primary emotions. Things like anxiety, anger, these are secondary emotions to fear. So I think in the work that we do, what we need to do is, is do what we're doing now, yeah, sure, identify that primary emotion, but then really be able to peel back that layer and even more and understand, okay, well, how did that emotion come to be? And in doing that, we will then uncover secondary emotions. And that's really where we have the best chance to make impact and make those interventions that are actually going to change behavior. So when we do journey work and we're doing the feel state, Yes, let's identify the fear, let's identify the joy, let's identify the sadness, but then let's also identify those secondary emotions that are involved in the complete picture. So again, 
One, we need to embed emotions into our research methodology, as I mentioned earlier. And more than anything else, and I think this is sort of the theme of this podcast series, is that we need to remember that humans are complex. Uh, Two AHCPs dealing with the same situation may be having the same primary emotion, but secondary emotions are totally different. And there's a lot that goes into why two people might be you know, facing different second or or feeling different secondary emotions, things like their cultural background, you know, where did their training take place? And what did what does that picture look like? When we think about doctors, there's the political aspect, there's the value system, there's a lot. Um, So, I mean, right, Brad, is that fair to say you do a lot of work in the culture space? How does that impact our secondary emotions? Yeah, I think, first of all, the first thing I want to say is the most important thing I think you said for people who are listening here is that there, there's really only 10 primary emotions, and then there's a slew of secondary emotions. And so when we look at primary emotions like fear, and then we don't go any further, um, even if we don't have any more data than that, it's it's a little bit unsophisticated to say like, well, they're afraid, so we'll just reassure them. Because Fear very often turns into one of those secondary emotions, right? Now, it's very complicated, the, the relationship between primary and secondary, what's a driver, what's a what's a result, all that sort of stuff. But let's take an example of a doctor. Now, this we know is true, certainly for some set of doctors. They're afraid to make a strong recommendation about a vaccine to a patient. Now, that's not because they're afraid of vaccines. They're afraid of the patient's reaction, and it, it could create what they call a face-threatening event, meaning something that just by the nature of me asking it threatens the nature of our relationship. Like, what do you think of me? You know, why would you think I would want this vaccine or I'm going to go doctor shopping or I'm so totally opposed to vaccines that even you bringing them up makes me mad at you, doctor. And so, we, you know, that's something that we've talked about a lot in various different vaccine states, Gardasil, um, you know, the HPV vaccines, flu vaccines, obviously the COVID vaccines, right? But just because a doctor may or may not be afraid of the patient's reaction, it doesn't mean that fear is what's present. They may, in fact, resent that they have this type of relationship, that they can't just tell patients what to do anymore. Or they may, in fact, be angry That's another secondary emotion, anger at the system that puts them in this position or angry at the political discourse that's going on that have led their patients to believe that vaccines are bad for them or this type of governmental control, right? So the fear then plays out into longer term emotions that are secondary and different, and we can't address them all in exactly the same way. So not only is fear not a good short term motivator, but when we just say like, oh, well, they're afraid we're being very unsophisticated about how complex people really are. And I think to your point about research, we have to get much better and more nuanced than just going like, well, it's fear. Yeah, everybody's afraid of death. I don't know too many people who are, and I don't think I've ever met one, but how that plays out in their day-to-day habits and actions is very, very complicated, right? Depression is a secondary emotion from fear. Anxiety, anger, something you and I have talked about quite a bit is, a lot of parental responses. Uh, Sonika is a new mom, new-ish mom, and I am a relatively seasoned parent. And we've talked quite a bit about like a lot of our reactions to stuff that children do when they're very young that's very dangerous, which is really fear-based, comes out as anger, uh, comes out as like, don't you ever play in the road again, you know? So Sonika, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. No, yeah, all the time, right? Like you find yourself getting angry or or showing anger, I should say showing, right? So the observable behavior is anger, but what's really going on inside is fear. I think, you know, parents can really, you know, growing up the rules that, you know, I think back to my parents and certain rules that were imposed on me. and, And when I would break them, all I would see is anger. And I'm like, oh, well, you're just angry at me because I didn't listen to you. But if I had understood, or if we as human beings can understand the primary emotion that sources a lot of that, uh, we can do a better job at changing our behavior effectively to actually be able to get the intended result that we want. And it just gives us a, a better picture where, where social science, behavioral science is the work to understand humans better. And so this is really um, a step to do that. Yeah. And I think when you provoke fear in people, and I've certainly, you know, um, throughout my career uh, have 
spent a lot of time in doctor patient consults observing them. I, I haven't I haven't done it in a while, but I used to do quite a bit of it. And um, in diabetes, you'll see doctors uh, trying to scare patients um, and, and with the best of intentions. Like, I want to be really transparent here. If you don't start getting your A1C under control, you're going to go blind or I'm going to have to remove your toes or something like that. Like truly scary, you know, outcomes. The result of trying to scare people that way is often resistance, just like teenagers, right? Like, well, you're trying to control me not you're trying to work with me, not you're trying to explain why you're afraid. So I'm just going to see anger and I'm going to mount resistance to that anger by not following your uh, orders, right? Like one of my favorite expressions is strict parents make skilled liars, right? Now, strict parents aren't strict parents because they desperately need control. I think they're afraid. Um, certainly in my case, when I've been strict, it's because I've been afraid of outcomes that I couldn't control, but that's not how it's perceived by the people who are receiving it. And this is not a parenting uh, podcast. So I think we're using this example to sort of say, like, everyone can identify on who's listening to this. Fear is not a simple emotion to just turn on. That sort of like brings us, I think, a little bit towards the end of things. I just want to make two final points here. One is advertising in general may make us a little bit sad, which is a hard thing to say since I work in advertising and so do you. But there was a recent Harvard Business Review article, recent-ish, a couple of years ago, that basically found an inverse correlation between overall happiness in a country and the amount of advertising spend. Now, the, 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 the conclusion they drew was that Ad spends make us sad because they are focused on uh, trying to make us do things in response to a gap that they are pointing out, whether it's uh, a safety gap or a convenience gap or, a, you know, wouldn't you love to go on vacation gap, those sorts of things. But by nature, ads are trying to make us unsatisfied. And that has a sort of degrading effect on overall happiness. I think Fear is absolutely one of those, right? If we just start spraying fear messages all over the place, A, people kind of shut down, but B, like what have we done to the society in which we live? Now everybody's terrified of something that they can't control. And so it starts to turn into things like resentment or, it's, or anger or something like that. But I, th I think outside of our narrow field of medical advertising, if you look at political advertising, there's an obvious turn right before elections happen to fear-based messaging. And it's the kind of thing like crime is out of control or, you know, this other party wins. They're just going to be handing your money over to people who are completely unworthy, right? Like these kind of fear-based messages and they really saturate the airwaves. The reason they do it is because, again, it's a short-term motivator. So two days before an election, one day before an election, that will work to generate the vote. The problem is for society, all that anger has to go somewhere beyond the vote. And if your side loses, now you're just angry. And so now you're resentful or angry or anxious or depressed about a political situation that before we spent $100 million making you angry and afraid and depressed and upset, it really wasn't top of mind. And so, I, you know, we're in an, uh, an ethically driven business, right? Like all of our clients, big pharma clients, healthcare clients in general, right? We, we have this mandate, do no harm. I just keep wanting to go back to this. Like fear is unpredictable. It's harmful. It hurts your body. It hurts your mind. And it can hurt society if we do it the wrong way. Now, I'm not so sure that we don't want to scare people sometimes, but I think using it as just a convenient lever because we discovered that they're afraid of something, some target audience is afraid of something, that's not the best thing to do. It's it's not effective, but it's also not maybe possibly moral. And so I, you know, I think that's a really important point to make. We are guardians of people's health. We are supposed to be participating in the furtherance of health. And I think health, well-being, wellness, mental health, they all get damaged by fear. Very, very, very often, as you said, we get asked, like, why shouldn't we use fear as a basis? And this is why. To the degree possible, I think, you know, in a 15-minute podcast, we've answered that question. To your point, I think there's a lot more about emotions. I think that interplay between primary and secondary emotions, I'd really love to hear you talk more about that in a future podcast episode. But for now, I think we'll sign off. So yeah. I'm Brad Davidson. And I'm Sonika Garcia. And this is Breaking the Code. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. Until next time. Bye. Bye.